here. Just one second while we get the live stream ready and then we are diving into the material. Thanks guys for your patience. I just wanna make sure that technologically we are working okay. stream ready and then we are diving into material thanks guys. all right so today we are talking about postural neurology and we are actually going to be discussing some implementable strategies that you guys can utilize in terms of assessments as well as correction so the whole point of postural neurology is that you understand the neurology of the posture system now the reason this is so beneficial is because when you understand the neurology of the posture system, then you can truly understand your patients at a whole new level. Now what I mean by that is that when you understand from a brain-based perspective, you understand the whole component. What tends to happen is that so many practitioners are focused segmentally. So and, and it's easy to fall into that trap. So I understand if that's where you're at right now in practice, understand that I do get where you're coming from in the sense that the patient comes in and they say, Hey, I hurt here and they point somewhere in their body could be their back could be their knee could be their toe could be their elbow and so we instantly look to that area what happens when we think segmentally is that we miss the master controller center of the body which of course is your brain when we have a brain-based focus then we're focusing on what controls every aspect of the body so when we think about postural, postural correction, postural assessments from a brain-based perspective, now we're looking at the entire organism and understanding from a brain-based approach how we can better assess and correct the posture system. Um, and with brain-based postural assessments and corrections, what we're doing is we want to identify where the origin of distortion is located within the brain. So what part of your brain has a deficit or dysfunction that's creating a postural distortion pattern? Once we identify that, then we can set up our postural correction treatment plan in a way that makes sense to stimulate the brain to get long-term postural correction results. So how is postural neurology applied within your practice? I think a lot of us, when we think about neurology, we have a couple of different emotions. One, we get excited because we know that we want to understand neurology, but two, it's a little bit overwhelming because you're thinking back to a class when you were memorizing a bunch of different tracks, all the different parts of the brain, and you, you were picturing that you would have to spend two hours per patient in order to understand them neurologically. So I want you to put all those objections aside and see how simple it truly is to implement postural neurology into your practice. And the fact that you don't need a bunch of fancy equipment, you don't have to spend hours per patient, and you don't have to memorize a bunch of facts and figures. What you do is you just understand the brain in relation to the posture system and the the posture system in relation to the brain, and it empowers you to learn more about the neurology and to get better results with your patients. So when we do brain-based posture analyses, the whole goal is to determine the patient's level of neural capacity when they come in. So when they come in on day one, we want to get that baseline level of neural capacity. Once we understand that and we understand where the origin of distortion is located, then we set up a brain-based postural rehabilitation program. Now at the American Posture Institute, we recommend the eyes spine vestibular treatment protocol. So what's really cool is that today, we're going to give you a taste of that so that you guys can actually see eye spine vestibular assessments and corrections in action. So why the eye spine vestibular treatment protocol? Well, the visual and the vestibular system, so eyes and vestibular, play a huge role in postural correction. In fact, it's almost impossible to get postural correction results if you ignore these two aspects of the neurologic system. And why the spine? Of course, we understand the spine from a structural perspective, but in addition from a structural perspective, going further to a neurologic perspective, then we understand that the spine is for sensory motor integration. So within the spinal column, we have the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is what connects your central and peripheral nervous systems. So any incoming afferent information that we have from our world, you know, we sense, um, we, we touch something and, and sense and feel it, then this information, or we move our joints, so proprioception, this information is transferred from the periphery, from the afferent aspect up to the contralateral sensory cortex. And then the motor response, after being brought to the sensory cortex, the motor response from the motor cortex then descends via the spinal column out to the periphery to have an appropriate response to that stimulus. So when we think about eyes, think visual system, head orientation, um, orientation and head posture. When you think spine, think sensory motor integration. And when you think vestibular, I want you to think balance and upright postural extension. So that's why we consider the gold standard to be eye spine vestibular. And we'll talk a lot more about that throughout the webinar and actually give you a practical application. 
So let's dive in first with the visual system. Now we'll talk about the visual system, how it relates to posture, go over a little bit of the anatomy. I don't wanna to get too stuck in the anatomy and physiology today because I wanna focus more on what this means for your patient who walks in the door on Monday. So the visual system, how is this important to posture? The role of the visual system is for orientation and for head posture. So let's talk about orientation first. When you think about orientation, I want you to think about how you orient yourself within the space and the environment around you. So much of our orientation is due to our visual system. Our ability to see our surroundings has a tremendous value to our life and a tremendous value to our ability to function as human beings and resist gravity. And if we think about the posture system, that's what posture really is resisting gravity upright, okay? So we don't fall with gravity, it's an ever-present force in our body, but it doesn't pull us down because we have the ability of resisting it upright. Now with the visual system, where the visual system plays an, an important role in orientation is because we can see our environment. So for example, um, just a really easy example, if you're walking and you see a speed bump, because you can see that, you then change the orientation of your body in relation to that speed bump so you don't just trip over it and then fall with an inability to resist gravity, okay? Think about when, um, when you close your eyes, how you get a little bit disoriented. So for example, you close your eyes and regardless of if you know where you are in, in space, so for example, a lot of you guys are in your office right now, or maybe some of you are at home. So you're in a place that's familiar to you. Now this familiar place, you know, for example, where the exit is from the room. So let's say you're in your assessment room and in your office and you know where the door is. But if I were to make you close your eyes and tell you to walk to the exit, we, in, instead of just walking very confidently, what would tend to happen when we close our eyes and we eliminate our visual field of gaze, suddenly we become, we change our posture position and we change our gait pattern because now we're reliant on the rest of our, our sensory systems to tell us how to get to the door. And suddenly our motor patterns are a little bit less adequate than they were before. So we compensate with our entire posture system with a lack of visual perception of orientation of where we are in our environment. Um, and what's interesting about this too is how we orient ourselves in relation to the visual system. We see this a lot with scoliosis patients. So if you were to look at um, patients, uh, like a subset of patients, a subpopulation that have deficits to the visual system, what you'll tend to see is that there's higher rates of scoliosis within this group. So the more visual deficit and dysfunction, the more common it is to actually see scoliosis. What's scoliosis? Scoliosis is a chronic postural distortion pattern, a lateral deviation of the thoracic spine thoracic and, and um, lumbar spine. So with orientation, then it's how we orient ourselves within our world. When we have visual dysfunction, then we have lack of orientation, which usually we compensate with our posture system. So again, if you have to find the exit by closing your eyes, you're probably going to walk like this. If you, you know, if you have a visual dysfunction leading to a scoliosis, it results in a lateral deviation of the thoracic spine. Those are a couple of examples. Now also head posture. So when you think about the visual system, I want you to associate it with orientation and with head posture. Now head posture is so important because what we do with our visual system is we're bipedal beings, right? So if you compare us to other animals, the animal kingdom, other animals are down here, okay? They're, they have a quadrupedal position. We have a bipedal position. So we stand on top of two feet and our visual system, we have a lot of reflexes and we have a lot of anatomy that is designed to keep our eyes parallel with the horizon. Now, the reason this is so important is because then our heads aren't bobbling in space. We have these protective mechanisms to keep our eyes parallel with the horizon. Now, when we go into head postural distortion patterns, we still wanna keep our eyes parallel with the horizon. So what we do if we have a head posture distortion is we then have a compensation with the rest of the posture system as well to keep the body upright against gravity. So what commonly happens is, for example, if you have a visual dysfunction where you can't read very well, what, what do you do? Do you squint forward into forward head posture? Or how about if your eyes can't converge to midline, how do you compensate for that? Head tilt. Or how about if you have a, um, an eye dominance where you see the world more so from one eye than the other, what do we develop over time? A chronic head rotation. So any sort of visual dysfunction has a direct impact on how we orient ourselves in space and also a direct impact on how we hold our head upright in space in relation to gravity or resulting in head posture distortion patterns. 
So when you think about the visual system in terms of posture system, I want you guys to think orientation and head posture. And then if we look at the anatomy here, um, this is your eyeball, obviously, and you can see that there's muscles surrounding it and there's nerves. What's really interesting is we, you know, the, the muscles of the eyes are just like any muscle of our body. You know, you go to the gym and you work out your biceps or you do squats and you work out your leg muscles. But what we tend to forget about is our eye muscles. And we have so many muscles and a lot of our neurology dedicated to this visual system. In fact, of our 12 cranial nerves, four of our cranial nerves are dedicated to the visual system. Surrounding each eye, we have six extraocular muscles. That's 12 muscles to control both eyes, just making small movements. So we realize how important this is to our anatomy. And then also I want you guys to think about that anytime that you're working a part of your system that's closer to the brain, it's more impactful. It's a, it's a stronger stimulus to the brain. So when you're actually working these muscles, just as you know, doing training of your eye muscles, just as you would with a bicep, then you're actually having a very strong stimulus to the brain because it's so close to the brain. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that we have the extraocular muscles that move the eyes in different directions. We have the cranial nerves as well. So you have cranial nerve two, which is your optic nerve, and that's for vision, to, for taking incoming light and then transferring it to the back of the brain so that you can actually see, so you can transform that into visual signals. But then we also have cranial nerves three, four, and six, which control the movements of the eyeball within the orbit. Now, this is important because if we have an inability to look in a certain direction, what's the first thing we do? So for example, if I can't look to my left, which to you guys is probably the right. So if I can't look to my left, what do I do? If I can't move my eyes here, I turn my head, don't I? Okay, so every time I have a visual dysfunction of the extraocular muscles or the nerves controlling those muscles, what happens is I compensate with my head posture. So an inability to move my eyes in a certain direction has a direct impact on my posture system. All right, so now let's talk about the vestibular system. So the vestibular system is equally as important and fascinating with its role of the posture system. And it's it's incredible because a lot of times we, again, we focus very segmentally and we miss this aspect. We miss the visual system. We miss the vestibular system. But once you actually understand the roles of these two systems, it seems crazy to think about that we don't spend more time focusing on it. So what I encourage you to do at the end of this webinar is to start opening your mind and thinking about how you can start checking visual and vestibular function of your patients. So what's the role of the vestibular system in relation to the posture system? Three main roles. So number one is equilibrium. So we've all heard this before that your inner ear controls your equilibrium. And what do these patients present with when they have inner ear dysfunction? I mean, in more extreme cases, beyond postural distortion patterns, they're going to present with motion sickness, with vertigo. I mean, highly compromising situations. So with equilibrium, then this is your postural stability and balance upright against gravity. So I talked to you a second ago about the fact that we're bipedal bodies. So we have these massive bodies on top of these very small bases of support, your two feet. So our feet are about this size, right? About the size of our hands, more or less. And we actually balance our entire body upright over this really small base of support. It's actually quite phenomenal if you consider the human framework in relation to other animals, which are quadrupedal. So they are, have the ability of balancing over four, you know, all fours, whereas we balance upright over two feet. And much of this is due to our ability to balance upright against gravity because of the vestibular system. So upright equilibrium is a vestibular function. Now also upright extension. So if you think about so many of your patients, they're gonna come in with this posture. They have forward head posture and they have anterior rolling of their shoulders. I know you guys see this posture all the time. We see it like every day. I mean, beyond who comes into your practice, it's like everybody else who doesn't come into your practice has this, right? Like you go to the supermarket and you're standing in line and you're watching people on their cell phone in this posture. You go to the airport and you look around and everybody waiting for their plane is sitting in this posture. Anterior rolling of the shoulders with forward head posture, right? So we see this posture everywhere and it's a, it's a frightening posture. Now this is a combination of visual and vestibular dysfunction. So our vestibular system controls upright extension. What happens when we collapse forward is we go into a flexor dominant position where gravity is pulling down on the body and we have flexor dominant. So our flexor musculature is more contracted and hyperactive 
whereas our extensor system is weakened. So our vestibular system controls upright extension, our ability to extend upright against gravity. Um, we have a couple of descending tracts. The lateral vestibular um, spinal tract specifically is for upright extension of, of the spine below the cervical below the cervical spine, so your thoracic and lumbar spine. Now, in addition to equilibrium and upright extension, which is fundamentally important, the, um, we have what's called the vestibular ocular reflex. So the, vi the visual system and the vestibular system work together in coordination to control your eye movements in relation to your head movements. So if we have visual or vestibular dysfunction, you can imagine, of course, we're going to result in head posture distortion patterns. Okay, and that's gonna be with the medial vestibular spinal tract. So let's talk about how the vestibular system connects with the rest of the brain. So first off, it connects with the cortex for perception of gravity. So within the parietal cortex, it, it actually has a perception of our body within gravity. And then the visual system. So it connects with the visual system to coordinate eye movements in relation to head movements. The vestibular system also communicates or correlates with the cerebellum for upright posture and for balance. And then also with the spinal cord for head and body position. Okay, so the vestibular system in, in and of itself is important, but then if you think about how it's connected to other parts of the brain and body, then we understand how fundamental it is to postural correction. And then looking more specifically at the vestibular spinal tract. So I told you just a second ago that you have the lateral and the medial vestibular spinal tracts. Now, don't worry about memorizing that. Just think about what that means. Vestibular spinal, vestibular system to spinal cord, right? Vestibular spinal. And what this means for us from a clinical perspective, because that's the most important part, just memorizing tracks means nothing, right? We've all been there. We've all done that in, in class. But what this means from an, an anatomical perspective or clinical application perspective is that your medial vestibular spinal tract descends with your visual system to coordinate eye and head movements, okay? Hugely fundamental. Meaning if we have dysfunction, then we of course have head posture distortion patterns. And then you have the lateral vestibular spinal tract, which descends from the vestibular nuclei in the brainstem down to, to coordinate upright extension of the spine below the cervical spine. So our inability to go into upright extension means that we go into flexor dominance, okay? So that's a dysfunction of the brainstem as well as dysfunction of the vestibular system that's preventing us from resisting gravity in an efficient manner. Hugely important to postural correction. Okay, so let's talk about, now that we understand what it is that we're talking about, let's talk about, again, application clinically. So brain-based postural assessment. Now, I want to give you guys three brain-based postural assessments that you guys can implement right away. Now, what's cool about these is they do not require any special equipment, right? <laughs> so if you guys showed up live today, which I just want to give you a shout out for showing, out, showing up live, that means that you want to learn. You want to take this knowledge. So if, if it's not just about showing up for knowledge. It's about showing up for knowledge and then taking this and applying it in practice. So I do encourage you to do that. I encourage you to test this out on your patients. So the first um, assessment that we're going to do is gaze stabilization and smooth pursuit. Okay, so this is going to be for the visual system. So the first check is for the visual system. Now, what's cool about this one test is you can actually test each of the fields of gaze. So just by using a pen tip, I mean, nothing special, or you could even use your finger, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a large circle or an eight shape. So it's more classic to do an eight shape. So you're gonna bring the pen or your finger into each field of gaze, okay? And you're going to test your patient's ability to do a smooth pursuit, meaning can they watch your finger go to the next position, okay? So this is a smooth pursuit. Once I get to that smooth pursuit, then I'm checking for gaze stabilization. Can I keep my eyes focused on that pen tip or on the, the fingertip, okay? So smooth pursuit and gaze stabilization. Now, what you're, going to, what you're gonna do is you're going to go in each field of gaze and you're gonna hold it there for at least 10 seconds to see if they can gaze stabilize for 10 seconds. It's really important that you preempt your patients and let them know that they should not move their head. Right? So when you're doing this examination, you want them just to move their eyes. If you don't tell them that, then they're going to move their head and that's going to give you a false positive finding. So I want you to make sure that you preempt that with the patient. Okay, so you're going to do an H shape. You're going to go in each field of direction, test their ability to smoothly move their eyes in that direction, and then gaze stabilize, hold their eyes in that direction. Okay, and then what you're looking for 
is you want to check for endurance of the gaze in that direction. So for example, if I go up and to the right and I hold that for 10 seconds, can I keep my eyes focused for 10 seconds? If they cannot, if they have decreased endurance or high fatigability, what you're going to see is that their eyes, instead of looking upright, they're going to go back to center and then back up to the pen tip. Okay. So you're going to see a saccade, just a quick saccade back to center, back to the target, back to center, back to the target. That's going to be an indication of a lack of endurance of in that, in that field of gaze. Okay. You might, yeah, nystagmus or quick saccade is written there. You might also see discomfort or blepharospasm, right? So if they start to withdraw or they say, oh, I have a headache, or they start to blink a lot, blepharospasm. And then you might also see postural changes, right? So if I'm looking up into the right and my eyes start to fatigue, what do I do? I move my head up into the right, okay? So if you see any of these things, lack of endurance, if you see nystagmus or quick saccades, if you see discomfort, blepharospasm, or you see postural changes for head rotation or change in head position, then this is all going to be positive indication that they have lack of gaze stabilization in that field of direction, okay? Now keep in mind, we have these different directions that the eyes can look. So if I can't look up and to the right, we just wanna note that, okay? They may be able to look down and to the left, no problem, but take note of where their dysfunction is, which direction can they not smooth pursue and which direction can they not gaze stabilize? So that's our first assessment that you guys are gonna do for the visual system. And then number two, the second assessment that you're gonna do is for the vestibular system. This one's called Fukuda's test. So Fukuda's test, you can see the pictures here is going to be that march in place test. Now, a lot of us learn this in school, I think, but I don't know necessarily if we learn the application of it, like what it actually meant. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the patient start in a specific area. Now you can see in this picture here, I'm standing in front of a posture grid. So what I like to do with our patients is they stand in front of a posture grid and they start marching in place there. So they close their eyes and they hands in front and start marching in place. Now, what we're evaluating for, the reason it's so important to have an, a specific start area is we wanna compare their end point to their starting point, okay? So I close my eyes, I start marching in place. Now at first, and we're, we're telling them to march in place, right? Now, what we're gonna see with vestibular dysfunction is they start to, to um, lateralize, okay? So then they're gonna open their eyes, they think they're marching in place, but they have an inability to um, resist gravity with perfect equilibrium, so what we see is a change in position. And then what's crazy is the patient opens their eyes and they go, how did I get all the way over here? I thought I was marching in place. So Fakuda's test is really good for you because you can easily see the side of lateralization, which is generally going to be the side of dysfunction of the vestibular system. Now that's also good patient education, right? So the patient goes, wow, I had no idea. I thought I was marching in place. So you can show them in comparison to where they, where they stopped in comparison to where they started. Okay, so that's Fukuda's test. And then again, what you're evaluating for is a side of lateralization. So you can see in this picture, this was my starting position and this was the ending position. Okay, compare the ending position, starting position. And I always say mark a place where they started so that they, you can definitely see the difference of where they went, okay? Um, and then the third assessment that you guys are going to do is posture imaging. Now, posture imaging is if there was just if there was one single assessment that everybody could do, I would say do posture imaging. Now, I, I think you should do all three, <laughs> but posture imaging in and of itself is absolutely a thousand percent fundamental to every posture practice. You can collect so much important information from posture from posture images. So for posture imaging. When you look at those postural distortion patterns, I want you to think, um, so when you go back to practice this afternoon or tomorrow in, in clinic, I want you to think from the perspective of neurology, okay? So from what we learned today. So when you do these assessments, I want you to think beyond just a structural postural distortion pattern, but what part of the neurology could be dysfunctional then leading to that postural distortion pattern. So if we look here, these are exaggerated examples. I purposely, I intended to put exaggerated examples, but what's interesting is you will see people that are this compromised. So in this first picture here, I have forward head posture, okay? So obviously the ear is anterior in relation to the shoulders. So with forward head posture, what I want you to think about is that that could be a visual dysfunction, right? So lack of visual acuity leads to a forward head posture. Head rotation, if you see a head rotation, this could be an eye dominance issue. So there could be a reason why I'm turning my head constantly to the right. It's because I see my world from my left eye. Or if I have right eye dominance, I'm gonna have 
um, I'm going to turn to the left because I see my eye from here, or I see my world from here, from my right eye. So when you think head rotation, think that it could be, um, it, it could be eye dominance. And when you see this lateral head tilt, I'll give you a couple options for lateral head tilt. We'll talk first from the visual perspective. If I see a lateral head tilt, this can be a convergence issue, meaning I can't bring my eyes to midline, so I tilt my head, okay? So when you see these on a posture image, I want you to start thinking from a neurologic perspective. And then from the vestibular perspective, so when you do your posture image, lateral head tilt, I told you I'd give you a couple options that it could be. It could also be decreased um, function of the otolith. So we didn't talk about this too much, but within the vestibular system, you have semicircular canals and you have otoliths, both of which are sensory organs to keep you upright in equilibrium. Now, when we have dysfunction of the otolith, what can tend to happen is that you have a head tilt toward the side of dysfunction. Okay, so with facutas, we walk towards the side of dysfunction. With a head tilt, if it is vestibular in nature, then you're gonna to lean towards the side of dysfunction if it's otolithic, okay? Um, also with flexor dominant posture. So we talked about how uh, the, um, the vestibular system controls upright extension. So if you see this anterior rolling of the shoulders and a flexor dominant position, so if you see this postural hyperkyphosis, then this can be due to in part from the visual, or excuse me, the vestibular system. So with lack of extension, meaning vestibular, okay? So it's gonna be a combination. We're not gonna talk about it on this webinar, but I will introduce this concept later in postural neurology. It's brainstem dysfunction, both a combination of the pontomedullary reticular formation and the vestibular system. For today, think vestibular, okay? So if you see this, which you see all the time, I mean, am I right? Do you guys see this every single day? You see this anterior rolling of the shoulders and postural hyperkyphosis position, this is going to be uh, due to vestibular, okay? Brainstem dysfunction as well as vestibular in nature. So those are, let's go quickly back to those assessments. So our three assessments are going to be gaze stabilization and smooth pursuits, okay, for visual, and then Fukuda's test for vestibular. And then we're going to do posture imaging, but we're gonna think about it from a neurologic perspective. And then what are we gonna do for corrections? So now that we know what we're looking for, let's talk about some brain-based postural correction strategies that you guys can implement with your patients. So first is going to be large eye circles. So we talked about the importance of being able to look in every direction. We want our patients to be able to smoothly move their eyes in that direction, and we want them to be able to maintain their gaze in that direction, right? So a smooth pursuit and gaze stabilization. So if you have the patient perform large eye circles, think about going around a clock. They're going to stop at each number on the clock and gaze stabilize, okay? So I'm going to hold for 10 seconds, hold for 10 seconds, hold for 10 seconds, hold for 10 seconds going all the way around the clock. So by doing large eye circles, we're working out those muscles of the eye that we commonly neglect, but that are so important to human physiology, okay? So they're gonna hold that gaze and they're gonna perform multiple rotations. This is something they can do clockwise as well as counterclockwise. And what's cool about this is that they're, they're really working their neurologic system, but it doesn't require a bunch of equipment and they can actually do this from their desk at work, right? So they can take two minutes and they can actually do this drill while they're at work. So large eye circles is number one. And then um, to maximize their time in your office while doing postural rehabilitation, I want you to think about how you can pair gaze stabilization with what they're already doing with postural rehabilitation. So for example, or also with your spinal alignment treatment, right? So while you're doing um, massage, for example, or while you're doing um, handheld vibration, while you're doing spinal joint manipulation, or while they're doing rehabilitation exercises, they can be looking, they can be gaze stabilizing in this direction of weakness. So I gave the example that if I can't look up into the right, I'm gonna move my head up into the right. Have the patient focus on keeping their, their head straight and looking up into the right. They can do this while doing a one leg balance, while doing, um, while doing a rowing exercise, while doing wall posture, whatever exercise you have them doing, posture angels, they can be looking up into the right. So by doing that, we're neuroloading, we're pairing gaze stabilization with other treatments or other modalities, hugely effective, okay? So again, for visual function, we're gonna work on large eye circles that the patient can do outside of the office as homework. And then while they're in the office, let's have them gaze stabilize with paired modalities, treatments, and exercises, okay? Um, and then for the, excuse me, for the vestibular system, we're gonna do extension exercises. Now, this is really important too, for all of our postural correction patients. 
is bringing them into extension. So, so many of our habits are flexor dominant. So we're hardly ever engaging that vestibular system to go into upright extension. So when we do extension exercises, like you can see, I'm doing a Superman exercise here. I'm stimulating that upright extension, which is controlled by the vestibular system. So it's really good feedback. So by doing these extension exercises, I'm going anti-gravity instead of being pulled forward into forward head, or excuse me, forward um, flexor dominant posture, forward head posture, and flexor dominant posture with gravity. So I'm gonna go into upright extension. So an example of extension exercises, this is one that I use all the time with our patients. Um, that's the Superman exercise. But what I want them to do is I want them to hold the extension so they can use an exercise ball like I'm doing here. They don't even have to have an exercise ball. They can do this straight from the ground and they're going to go up into extension and hold for at least 10 seconds and then perform five repetitions. As they get better, have them hold it longer. Okay. So pair this with what you're already doing in terms of your treatment protocols. And then from a postural correction perspective, I also want you having them do neck retractions if they present with forward head posture. So with neck retractions, you guys, um, you've seen this exercise before. This is not new information. It's just about implementing. So with neck retractions, you start in forward head posture, pull back, retract, and hold. Now you can see that I'm retracting back and holding here. You can do this against resistance with a resistance band um, with weights. You know, you can, you can make it more difficult for the patient depending upon where they are in their treatment plan. But with neck retractions, in addition to segmentally helping reverse the postural distortion pattern of forward head posture, what we're also doing is we're stimulating the vestibular system, the otolus, by going into a deceleration and back into vertical motion. Okay. So by, by doing this, we're stimulating the vestibular system, plus we're reversing the postural distortion pattern of forward head posture. So doing neck retractions. And as I mentioned here with extension exercises, the point is not to do a million repetitions. The point is to do a good contraction and hold. So have them hold the neck retraction for 10 seconds and repeat five times. Okay. Now they can do this one at work too. They can do this in your office or they can do this at work. And then posture breaks. So if I'm forward, if I'm in flexor dominant posture here, I want to reverse that by going anti-gravity. So for 30 seconds every hour, performing a posture break where I go upright into upright extension against gravity. So that it stretches our flexors and stimulates and ignites the extensors in the back. So with posture breaks, this is something they do throughout the day, not just a one and done. This is something that they're going to do for 30 seconds every hour of their work day. Okay. So they're seated at their desk in front of their computer. They're in flexor dominant posture. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have them engage for 30 seconds, going into an upright extended posture with a posture break. So you can see that here. Okay. So instead of flexing forward, I'm going into upright postural extension with a posture break. It works so good. So have your patients really do this. You can see this picture. I'm wearing a bracelet. Now what those are is that's a posture reminder specifically as a reminder to do your posture break throughout the day. So if you give your patients a posture reminder, they're more inclined to actually do what you're telling them because they, once they get to work, they get busy, right? It's not that they don't want to do their posture rehabilitation, but they just forget. So give them the tools that they need to be successful with integrating posture breaks into their daily lives. All right, so quick review of our corrections. So the brain-based postural corrections are going to be large eye circles for smooth pursuits and gaze stabilization for the visual system. And then it's going to be extension exercises for the stimulation of the vestibular system, neck retractions to reverse forward head posture, and posture breaks to reverse that C-shaped spinal curvature or a postural hyperkyphosis. So that's postural neurology. I wanted to share with you guys that clinical application today. So what's so cool about understanding neurology is that from a clinical perspective, I can promise you it makes your life so much easier. So again, at the beginning of the webinar, I was talking about how we commonly have these objections to learning neurology, like, oh, I really want to know neurology, but it's just so daunting to think of memorizing all those tracks and it's just going to take forever per patient. The reality is with postural neurology is it doesn't have to be that way. The reality is, is when you understand that neurology and you understand how to assess it and correct it, then you can integrate this stuff with every single patient. And, you know, everyone can benefit from postural neurology, right? So if you see any sort of visual dysfunction, have them do vis visual drills in addition to the treatments that you're already giving them. If you see that they have this flexor dominant posture, have them do upright extension drills, have them do balance training to stimulate that vestibular system for better function. And the next time that you look at a posture image, 
which I hope everybody's already doing posture imaging, but next time you look at one, stop thinking so segmentally and think, okay, what part of the neurology that controls the posture system is then creating the origin of distortion, then resulting in a long-term postural um, distortion pattern. Because when you think that way, then you can stimulate the brain in different areas during the postural rehabilitation, eyes find vestibular, to then stimulate long-term postural correction results. So it's an absolute win-win. It truly makes your life easier understanding neurology. And the best part about it is that when you get better results, you grow your practice in a very ethical manner. So this is not about lying to the patient. It's not about telling them a story. It's not about a sales, you know, like a marketing tactic or a sales gimmick. Not at all. This is straight up getting results. And so when you focus on getting results and when you know with certainty that you understand the neurology, then you can get the best results in town. That by far is the best, most fulfilling way to grow your practice because it keeps the patient happy. You're focused on results. You're not just focusing on selling the patient into a system. You're seriously focused on getting results and you understand the neurology and you understand what it takes to make neuroplastic changes. Now, I'm going to do another webinar coming up. Um, we'll send you guys information about it. And that's how to set up your treatment plans based upon neuroplasticity. That's one of my absolute favorite topics to talk about because when we understand brain function, then we understand how long we should see a patient for. We understand how we should stimulate their brain. We understand how to set up our treatment plans. So instead of just classifying everybody into a one size fits all plan, then we actually understand how to set up those treatment plans. So we'll do another webinar on that. That's a big topic. So I want to give it ample um, time dedicated to neuroplasticity. But when we understand neuroplasticity, I promise that too is going to make your life so much easier. So grow your practice by getting superior clinical results. That's the coolest part about postural neurology. Now, as we conclude our webinar today, we are going to go into a live Q&A session. So if you guys have any questions, definitely type those in the comments. Um, and, but there's a couple of things I want you guys to do. You know, you guys join the webinar today. I want you to actually implement this with your patients. So implement it and see what you find. You know, do a Fukuda's test today and see if you see lateralization. Check gaze stabilization and see if they go into a postural distortion pattern. Check their posture images. Relook at a posture image that you took this morning and think about, okay, now that I know the visual and vestibular system, how can I apply this to my patient? And then um, check your email for follow-up guides. So it's impossible to cover all the information about the visual and the vestibular system in just 45 minutes. But what I want to do is I want to send you guys more information. So we're going to send you a vestibular guide and a visual guide. So check your email and you're going to receive that within the next couple of days. And then I also want to encourage you to join our Facebook group to keep the conversation going. So within our Facebook group, it's called Posture Correction Strategies for Healthcare Professionals. Some of you might already be members. If not, just request access. So just type that into um, your search box and it's going to come up. And that's a Facebook group. So within this Facebook group, you can connect with tons of like-minded colleagues, all centered around getting great results, right? So we focus on postural correction strategies for all healthcare providers in this Facebook group. And I want to give you, extend a personal welcome to you and invite you to join us in that Facebook group. Okay, so three calls to action. Implement the stuff with your patients, number one. Number two, check your email for a couple of guides coming to you on the visual system, the vestibular system, and then join our Facebook group. In the Facebook group, you can connect with like-minded colleagues and get ongoing trainings and updates of how you can stay connected with postural neurology. All right, so at this point, I want to welcome you guys to, if you have any questions, to go ahead and post those in the comment box. Again, I want to make sure that this is just adds a ton of value to you, to your practice, to your patients. So if you have any questions about anything that we covered today, go ahead and type it in the comment box and I'm more than happy to respond. And in the meantime, I just want to say again, I appreciate you guys taking out the time from your day to learn more. I mean, the people who show up on live webinars, they're saying, listen, I want to learn more. I want to know more. Teach me. So that's what today was all about. Now it's up to you. You got to take this information. You got to implement it into your practice. And what people ask me all the time is how hard or how difficult is it to implement this stuff? And I just want to reiterate that implementation is really simple if you just do it. Um, with postural neurology, we've actually taken these big concepts and put it together in a manner that's super simple to integrate with your normal patient interactions. So you don't have to have special neurology appointments. You don't have to have this you know, whole fancy center for it. What you can do is take this information, understand it, and integrate it with your assessments and with your corrections. Um, Catherine says, thank you for the information. You're so welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. All right, looks like we have somebody in the Q&A. One second. 
Okay. Um, and then Beverly asked, is Facuda the same as a middle Myers test? You know what? I'll be honest. I don't know the middle Myers test. So it might be, um, it might be the same movement, but looking for different things. So the answer to your question is I'm not sure exactly what middle Myers is looking for Beverly, but, um, what we're looking for with Facuda's because I know a lot of people already do the marching test in their practices. So maybe that's what middle Myers is, but what we're looking for with Facuda's is specifically lateralization due to vestibular dysfunction. Okay. So that's a Facuda's test and you guys should try it out. I think you're going to be shocked what you see. You're going to see patients walking all over the office. And anytime that you do a test like that, it's really good information for you, the practitioner, but it's also really good information for the patient because when they see that, when they see their posture image, that's another really good one for patient education. When they see their posture image, when they see that they can't perform a task, when they see that they thought they were walking in, you know, in one area and they're ended up halfway across the room, this brings to their attention that they actually have a problem. And what's cool about it is as you correct their posture system, they instantly see results. So they see results with how they, how they feel. I mean, they feel better, but also they can see objective results with neurology. So it's really cool. All right, Bruce says, thanks for the great info. You're so welcome, Bruce. Looking forward to the next webinar. Cool. So we, yeah, in the next webinar, we'll talk more about neuroplasticity because I really want you guys to understand how to take this information from a neuroplastic, um, from a neuroplasticity standpoint and set up those treatment plans. Really important. Um, Denver Hudson says, great session today. Will there be a recording of today's webinar? We'd love to review parts of the presentation. Absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to email you. So we, again, our goal is just to add value to you. So we're going to email you the replay, plus we're going to send you a couple of guides. And within those guides, it actually has this information broken down also in a written format as well. So no problem there. And Stacy Harrison says, great info. Thank you very much. You're so welcome, Stacy. Thank you for your time. Thanks for showing up. Um, it's not something that I've considered when treating. Yeah. And Stacy, I want you to know that you're not alone on that, right? So, so many of us were taught just from a musculoskeletal perspective. So many of us just think segmentally and it, 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 like, it's not your fault that you think that way. It's what's been ingrained into our, into our psyche, into our understanding from a clinical perspective. So when you understand the neurology, it's like suddenly it opens up Pandora's box of new knowledge and information. So you start thinking, wow, I haven't been looking at the brain this whole time. And then you start realizing, well, how come I haven't been looking at the brain when the brain controls every aspect of the body? So when we have those brain-based assessments and corrections, we can actually see these changes taking place and we can get feedback right away that what we're doing is working. Or if we get feedback that something's not working, great, that's feedback that we need to change instantly. So we can get that feedback instead of doing like 12 visits and then seeing if we got a result. Let's avoid that. Let's go straight in by understanding from our assessments, the brain-based function, and then integrating that with our rehabilitation to get great results. Um, let's see. Talitha says, thank you for the info. You're so welcome. Thank you for joining. Guys, we're going to wrap it up here in a second. If you have any further questions, just last opportunity to type it in. Um, again, a couple calls to action. Join the conversation at the American Posture Institute. So join us on Facebook, the Facebook group. I'll actually just type that in here so you guys can see it. It's called Posture Correction Strategies, and that's for healthcare providers. Posture Correction Strategies for healthcare professionals. Okay, so that's typed in there. So join us on Facebook. Um, be sure to check your emails for those guides and the replay. And then in addition to that, implement, right? Check this stuff out on your patients. That, that's your homework is to actually test this out on a patient and see what you find. Um, and then Stacy says, do the lower body dysfunctions occur? Yeah. So when it comes to lower body dysfunctions, we were focusing more so today on head posture distortion patterns, but absolutely. So even of the, of the lower posture quadrants, when we have dysfunction of the lower posture quadrants, then those are going to be neurologic based as well. So we'll talk more about that in postural neurology. That's a bigger conversation, but just know that anytime that you have dysfunction of the visual and the vestibular system, and also the brainstem, which we didn't have a lot of time to talk about today, that that's going to result in postural distortion patterns. All right, and then Empower, that's a great name, says, thanks for the information, gotta get back to your members. Awesome, thanks for joining us live. 
All right, guys, again, join us in the Facebook group, implement this information, have a ton of fun. Understanding postural neurology, I promise you, is literally the most fulfilling way to grow your practice. When you're focused on results and you're focused on becoming the expert that you've always dreamed of becoming, that hands down is the best way to grow your practice every time. This is not about selling your patients on an idea. This is not about lying to your patients. This is all about clinical results. It's all about brain-based postural, postural assessments and brain-based postural correction results that we're going to evaluate objectively over time. So we'll follow up with you guys via email. Um, we're going to have another live webinar, I think in a couple weeks or so. Um, we'll talk more about neuroplasticity. And I just want to extend to you guys a thank you for showing up, for learning this information. Now go implement. It's posture by design and not by circumstance.